Amy told me one that I had from 11 to 11.50, and then as soon as I drove up this morning, she said, oh, and by the way, at 11.30, there's going to be a three-minute fire drill, so <laughs> don't let that bother you. So, um, and I was asked to tell y'all that it will be about a two to three-minute, maybe four-minute siren blaring in your ears, so cover your ears for about three to, like I said, three to five minutes, and... I said, can you narrow that down? And they said, well, as long as it takes everybody to get out of the building, we'll leave it on. So however long it takes all the kids to get out of the building is as long as they'll, they'll leave the alarm on. So when it starts at 1130, if I don't freak out, y'all just put your, ears in, or your fingers in your ears. Okay? Um, so yeah, Miss Amy asked me to come down and talk about some water issues. And really, water in general, and I really did water in general. And I forgot to tell Miss Amy um, when she asked me to do this about four or five months ago that I was going to have a cold today. So um, if I start coughing and whatnot, I apologize. It's not y'all. It's, it's me because I forgot to tell her. So, but I am the Water Resource Management Specialist for the University of Georgia College of Ag and Environmental Sciences. And what that means is I deal with water. Water from every aspect you can look at, um, from irrigation to um, some stormwater stuff we're doing curing, to septic tanks, to water management, to erosion, to sediment control, to um, crop production using water. So all those things under one big umbrella is what I'm supposed to do every day, which gets a little bit overwhelming, but coming to talk with you folks is kind of nice, because then I get to really back up and look at water from the quote unquote bird's eye view. And that's what I hope we do today. So just to start, and, and ladies and gentlemen over there, and ladies and gentlemen over here, I'm probably just going to stay here in the middle. I'm not going to walk. So it's not against y'all. It's just I'm probably not going to walk way over there and walk way back over here. Um, okay, I'll be Okay, so as we start talking about water, we have to really start looking at water itself. And water is a molecule. It's a polar inorganic compound that is at room temperature, a tasteless, odorous liquid, nearly colorless and blue. Okay? Some of the other properties of water is a universal solvent. What does that mean for us? A universal solvent means that it will just about dissolve anything. I mean, if you've ever baked anything on top of your stove like I do most of the time um, when it drips out of the pan, and y'all probably know this, put you a wet towel on it for about 20 minutes and come back and it wipes right off. Or, in my case, if my wife says, get it off now, I have to spend 20 minutes scrubbing it off. So that's the universal solvent. It dissolves pretty much anything. So when we're using anything we need, water is that base. Y'all know the boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. The freezing point, 32 degrees um, Fahrenheit, 0 degrees Celsius. How many of you knew water had a triple point? How many of you knew that there was a point for water where all three phases of water, liquid, vapor, and um, solid, actually meet together? That's at oops, this point right here. Oops, sorry. Let me go over here. For you guys, that's right here. And now i got to go to the other side of the room. Way over here. For you guys, it's right here. Okay. So, water has this triple point, which makes it unique as itself, other than these other properties. And then um, Leopold said, way back when, water is the most critical resource issue of our lifetime and our children's lifetime. The health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. And so think about that. What we do on the land affects what happens to that water. When we put fertilizer out, if it rains like it did last night, at least up in the Athens area, that potentially can run off. If we put pesticides out, that can run off. And the biggest sediment or the biggest pollutant that we look at for water is sediment. When the water hits the ground from rain, irrigation, whatever purposes, you know, whatever reasons, it causes splash erosion. That splash erosion then causes that water to pick up that sediment and move it to our creeks and rivers. And how many of you do a Dr. Stream biological stuff? 
A couple of you. So what do you look at? You look at the macro invertebrates in the stream, right? Well, when we get large storms and it moves a lot of sediment off site, it causes those little macro invertebrates to have to uproot and go elsewhere. Because it's like a mudslide coming down across our house every time. So sediment's another issue we have to deal with. So what we do on the land affects the water. Okay, so in your in your package on this mark, I think it's the yellow sheet, right? right. Yeah. On the yellow sheet, um, we printed and yours is actually white on Yes. So there's actually another um, picture of the water cycle. And obviously some of you are yellow, some of you are white. Um, so this is a, a picture of where the water is on the earth. If you flip it over on one side of the water cycle, if you flip it over on the back side, it kind of goes through. It's not this is that same picture, but it looks at how much water is on the earth. And this depiction shows that up there in the upper left-hand corner is the world. As you know, on the world, if we took all the water, and what this is doing is taking all the water, and it's making it one gallon of water. So think about this. If you ever do any programming for kids at your garden clubs or whatnot, take a gallon of water. That's all the water on the earth. You split that out into 3.8 milliliters, or I mean not milliliters, ounces, or 114 milliliters. That's all the fresh water on the earth. That's the glaciers and everything else is fresh water. So that 3%, if you look here at the very bottom, then 70% of that 114 milliliters is in glaciers. We can't use the glaciers as water, um, as you know, it's ice. 29% of that's in the aquifer system. And if you're from southwest Georgia, you've been hearing a lot about the, the water wars and the water wars are related to that aquifer. Um, so 29% of our water is there. 1% then of the 3% of the gallon, or all the water on the earth, is actually in rivers, streams, and lakes that we can get a hold of, we can use on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you think about it, that's 1.1 milliliter. So if you're doing this at your garden club for the kids, that's like <coughs> one drop of water out of that gallon is all the fresh water we have to use, and we have available to use on the earth. So that's why water is important for what we do, why we do, and what we do on the land that relates back to that water. Okay, so where is the water on this earth, or in Georgia specifically? So if we look, this is going back to the water cycle now. That's on the flip side of the page. So if we start looking at it, we've got on the upper right hand corner the sun. And that's usually when I talk to kids, I talk about the sun being the star. Obviously the water cycle is a cycle. It doesn't start or end anywhere. But as a starting point, the sun causes evaporation. So it water evaporates from multiple, multiple, multiple different places. Crop fields, open, um, open bodies of water. I even tell the kids, if you leave your glass of water out on the table overnight, you don't have to worry about pouring it out because it's going to evaporate more times than not. Even that little glass of water evaporates. Gets up into the atmosphere, condenses in clouds, precipitates, and then it runs off for infiltrates. I work a lot with, sorry guys over there, um, with the infiltration part and the groundwater movement part of water. Also, like I said, one work some with the runoff, but a lot with the infiltration side of it. So how do we get more water into the ground? And when we get water into the ground, how does it then hit in, in its base flow, or what they call underground movement, back to our river streams and streams? So in drought conditions, we actually have some water moving back into those creeks and rivers. Just another depiction of what that looks like. Um, in Georgia, just show of hands, how many people have an idea of how many inches on average we get in Georgia on an annual basis? You might say, I know it's up there on the screen, so that's kind of cheap. What is it? I was thinking it was about 60 inches. It's about 50 to 52 inches a year <coughs> is what we get in Georgia. Now, if you go into mountains, you get a little bit about 54 ish. If you go down to the coast, it's a little reversed. 48 ish up in the mountains. About 52 to 54 on the coast. So on average, about 52 inches of rain per year. 
Now, as y'all know, we get a lot of that, and more we're getting in flashes. So we get a lot of rain real quick, and if our soils can't handle it, then it goes <coughs> off. It carries the soil, it carries those pesticides, it carries the nutrients, it carries whatever else with it down to our creeks and rivers. And again, the little macroinvertebrates gets their house kind of muddied over. Um, and it causes other problems that, we're, that we know of. Um, it causes flooding if the sediment gets into creeks and rivers, but that's a whole different topic for a whole different day. So what about you guys? Where do y'all fit into this? This is actually the top part here. It's from the Garden Club of Georgia's position paper of 2003, so it's a little bit old, but it's still very relevant to the water issue. And I just sliced and diced it a little bit, but it says the reduction of water pollution by reduction of non-point source pollution from stormwater runoff. Again, that's the water that hits the ground and runs off into our ditches, into our gutters, into our curbs, or onto our curbs, into our gutters, down to the creeks and rivers. The second one there, increased funding for public education and clean water programs. You guys do a lot of that, and, and we thank you. In the university system, because myself, Kieran, and others, we use some of this money that's publicly available to do programs like this and other water-related programs from anybody from kindergarten all the way up to mature adults. I'll put it that way. Um, <laughs> the second one is protection of our ecosystems, restoration, preservation of our wetlands, um, protection of ground and surface waters, and again, public education. So the work y'all are doing in the garden clubs is really looking at this water issue and how we protect it. The other societies listed um, on the registration form, the Native Plant Society, the um, biological, I mean, the botanical group, GCLIP, GCCP, GGIA, dot, 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 okay? A lot of you guys don't necessarily deal with the water, but you deal with things that need the water, that you need clean water for. One of the things with the GCLIP group and the GGIA and GCPP is we've been doing some irrigation training. How do we get water efficiently out to our lawns so that we will have the water there we don't kill our plants, we don't kill our shrubs, we don't kill our grass because we're overwatering. We're putting it on when it needs it, why it needs it, and how often does it need it. So that's some of the training we've been doing as well. So let's get into the details then. So watersheds, um, how many of you know what a watershed is? Here's the old question. How many of you live in a watershed? Okay. Everybody raise your hand. Everybody, okay. This is participation. Everybody raise your hand. Okay, everybody lives in a watershed. And so a watershed, the way I always explain it to young folks, like y'all self, is that you as a land um, area that drains water to a given outlet. What does that mean? Sometimes that's hard for young folks like y'all and younger folks like them to understand. So think of a bathtub. How many of you take a bath at least once a week? Okay. <laughs> So if you take a bath at least once a week, you, you've taken a bath or a shower, and you know that all the water that comes into that bathtub or into that shower drains out the hole, the drain, right? That tub, that sink, that whatever is a watershed. All the water drains to one spot. Now, another way I like to teach folks about watersheds is using a leaf. And last Saturday, I've used this same example with K through fifth graders. Take a leaf, flip it over, and look at it. What do you notice? And you guys should know what you notice when you flip the leaf over, right? <laughs> you notice these little veins in it. The guys over there, I point to the leaf. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look at the veins on the back of a leaf, they go up. And what's the purpose of those veins? To carry water from the roots, through the trunk, through the stems, and the, and the limbs, up to the leaf, right? Well, if you do that in reverse, that's a watershed. So anything that hits this leaf will theoretically 
run down to the closest little vein, runs down to the bigger vein, down to the bigger vein, down to the stem, and out to the tree itself. Or in a watershed instant, the water runs from the land to the creek, to the stream, to the river, to the ocean. Okay? So that's kind of how it goes. So this is a very good way, again, if you do garden club meetings for the K through 6, K through 12 groups, give them a leaf and explain watersheds to them. Because it looks like a watershed on the back of it. Now, how many watersheds do we have in the state of Georgia? Any guesses? <laughs> 52. Y'all are the smartest group I've talked to today, let me tell you. So there, there's 52 watersheds. Now, how many of you who didn't know that you lived in a watershed now realize you live in a watershed? Okay. For those who said they lived in a watershed, do you know which watershed you live in? That's the big trick, right? So if you, we all live in a watershed, right? Now the question is, which watershed do we live in and where does that water go? So there's 52 large watersheds in the state of Georgia. There's 14 river basins around and focused on the different, the 14 different rivers in the state of Georgia. So we, we added these 52 together, we formed the 14 river basins. Now, how many of you are part of the water councils that's going on right now, the regional water councils? They are in somewhat, some order, sort of revolved around these 14 river basins. There's 11 of them in the state of Georgia. Right now, they're actually going through the revision of the water council plans. I know Savannah, Ogeechee, the purple and yellow on the right-hand side of the map here, is having a meeting March the 19th. If you want to, I can send it to Amy and let y'all know about it. But they're going through the manage of practice and update of that plan right now. And what that plan does, if you hadn't heard about it, real quick, before the alarm goes off, and that should be in about 45 seconds. Um, the plan is actually set up, and it was developed five years ago, and it's set up to give the regions, these water council regions, some indication of how the water is used, where the water's coming from, and how do we manage water in these river basins across Georgia. So get involved in that if you can. Okay, that's my commercial for now. Now, in Georgia, it's very interesting. Georgia, water goes to two different places, ultimately, in Georgia. If you are, oops, if you are on the blue, light blue side of the map, the right-hand side of the map, all that water drains to the ocean. If you are on the, I'll come over here for now, on the green red side of the map, all that water goes to the Gulf of Mexico. And I was talking to one farmer here in Appling County, and he said his backyard water went in two different directions. <laughs> part of it went to the ocean, and part went to the Gulf. And he said it's just kind of funny watching his backyard when it rains because he knows water's going in very two opposite directions. <laughs> So that's so when we start looking at this and we know where the water goes, we need to then start thinking about what do we do on the land to protect this water because ultimately it's going to hit our backyard. It's going to run off of our backyard potentially. It's going to get into the street. It's going to run down to the creek. The creek's going to hit the stream. The stream's going to hit the river. The river's going to hit the ocean or the lake or whatever's in between. So what we do on our land protects the water or hinders the water, just like everybody else. <laughs> okay, so when we start talking about watershed protection, we then need to know, one, where our watershed is, what watershed we live in, and then how do we do in our watershed to protect the water before it gets downstream. So reduction of non-point source pollution from stormwater runoff, and what is stormwater? Any idea? Man, y'all are getting good at this, let me tell you. Um, so it's an abnormal amount of surface water due to a heavy rain or snowfall. And so when that water hits the ground, how many of you, and, and y'all can close your eyes if you want to, how many of you at Walmart or one of these bigger box stores has ever stood out in the rain and watched the water run off the parking lot? Go ahead. Nobody's going to laugh at you. I know y'all do it, right? So... 
that's a, another way. Where does that order go? And my kids always laugh at me because I do that. They go, Daddy, you're such an engineer. You're such a geek. I'm like, yeah, but don't y'all, y'all are enjoying standing here with me, right? And they go, yeah, we are. And I'm like, okay. But when we start talking about storm water, what does that storm water carry with it? The oil, the soil, the nutrients, the pesticides. Anything that's on that ground, on that asphalt, on that concrete, hits the ditch, hits the this, hits the that, and eventually can end up in those. Okay? So we have to start looking at how do we protect our water from the storm water, and, and how do we use the storm water, and, and, and maybe manage the storm water so that we're not getting flooding downstream of, of wherever we are in our watershed. So where does storm water exist? I thought this was cute. Um, back a couple years ago, we went to Virginia. This is Jamestown Plantation. Jamestown being the very first plantation, not plantation, but settlement in America. And I started looking in the Bahamtone, I can't say that right, Indians practice storm water management. And when we were walking around these old replica huts, I noticed here, in the very bottom right hand corner, <laughs> y'all see that? Y'all didn't laugh this hard over here. So, so if you look at it, they practice storm water management even when the Indians came over. <laughs> and I was looking at that and I said, give me a camera. And my wife and my girls go, oh my gosh, what are you doing? I said, look, they're practicing storm water management way back in the Indian times. I've got to take a picture of this. And they say, Daddy, you know that didn't happen. I said, I know it didn't. But it looks so cool, don't it? <laughs> so obviously, it got a double laugh. So that was the whole purpose behind it. So good. Um, but no, when we start really thinking about stormwater, stormwater comes from multiple different areas, right? Urban areas. Last night again, when it rained in Athens, I stopped at the curb and my girl, my oldest daughter, and I was going, look, look at all that water running down. Where is it going to do? She goes, Daddy, it's coming from up there. It's running down here. It's going to the creek. And I'm like, and? She goes, and it's going to pollute the creek. And I said, and? And she goes, that's not good. And I said, okay, good. And, and so then it comes from rural areas. And when we talk about rural areas, we're talking about mainly agricultural land. Um, obviously, there's more things in rural areas than agricultural land. But that's where we think a lot about water flowing off. But it can also occur, obviously, in both. So I want to talk a little bit about those now. Stormwater in urban areas, this is what we normally think about. And I think one of the funniest things is, is um, like Amy said, I work for UGA, and my job is to really work with the county extension agents across the state. Now, how many of you know your county extension agent? Okay, next time, and y'all can tell them I did it, after you ask the question, okay? Not before. Go up to them and say, hey, whatever their name is, what is stormwater? And do we have it in our county? <laughs> okay? And, and then after they don't answer, then you can tell them I asked you to ask that, then they'll be mad at me, see? But I, I say that because I've asked some of our rural counties, let me go back here, our rural county agents, I said, do we deal with stormwater in rural Georgia? And not picking on the agents, okay? That's not what I'm fixing to do. But they say, no, we don't deal with stormwater in rural areas. We deal with erosion and sediment. And I talk to the urban guys, and they go, heck yeah, we got stormwater everywhere. We got to deal with it. And so I'm trying to get them to understand that this occurs. And I point to the boat at the bottom, guys, on either side. So both areas have stormwater. Urban looks like this, oops, this. And rural looks like what I'll show you in a minute, sediment runoff from fields and from open pastures and those type things. This is a picture I took when I was at Tennessee, University of Tennessee back, um, I won't tell you how many years ago now. Um, but if you look very, very, very close in this picture, and I'll try to do this for you here in the center, about right there. You can see if you see anything unique. You guys over here, it's about right there. And for you over there, well here, I'll walk over here. But look at it very closely and see what you see. 
right in here. If you look right there on those three different pictures, there's a stormwater drain. It's under about 12 inches of sediment. And this came off me and my lab partner at the time. If you notice upstream, all the erosion that's occurred. On the right, you see the light beige color. That's some silk fabric type material. That hay cover that they put over a disturbed area. And just to the right of that, they're building a little strip mall. So our project was to measure sediment, look at sediment, and what happens to it, where does it come from? This was our project site. What you can't see in this picture is about where I'm standing is a four lane highway that all this runs over now because it can't go in that stormwater drain, which is 8 to 12 inches underneath it. And then it goes into a little creek on the other side of the four lane highway. So it is kind of interesting to just watch this site over about two or three years. So in the urban areas, how do we deal with stormwater? And, and that's where, I mean, I expect you guys that come in. And you guys work rain barrels. How many of you built rain barrels before? I had our county extension agent the other day. We went and got some just 55 gallon drums, and that was it, just the drums. And he said, Where are those rain barrels we built? And I said, Yeah, we ain't building rain barrels. We got barrels, and you got to build the rain barrel part of it. He goes, Dang, that's what I figured you was going to say. But rain barrels, what's their purpose? It's to slow that water down, coming off the house so that we can use that water later on for flowers or for whatever purposes around the yard. Now, can we use this for irrigation of our, our flower beds? We can, we just gotta have a pump to pump the water. Um, but we can still use this work. Do what? There you go, carrying buckets works too. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, the buckets work great, except it gets tiring after a while. So. Um, but the other thing you have to look about with this is more quality aspects of this work. Obviously, don't go get a cool drink out of this barrel, right? Um, if you've got sensitive plants, and again, Amy told you I was an engineer, so I know nothing about plants except they grow, and those on your table are probably not alive, okay? That's what I do. Are they? Okay, they are alive. Sorry, see? <laughs> Bring an engineer to a, a symposium on wildflowers and, and living plants, and he messes it up. See, but make sure the plants that you're using this water for is not a very, very sensitive plant. Because if this is coming off your house and you got asphalt shingles, is the oil or anything in that asphalt going to affect the plants you're putting on? Don't definitely don't let anybody drink this water because of birds light on the top of your house, they have a tendency to maneuver as they take off or as they sit there, so that water is going to get into these barrels, so you don't necessarily need to drink the water. The plants don't usually have a problem with that. If you have a tin roof or a metal roof, what are some of the, the metals that they don't pull off very much, but every once in a while some of the metals will dissolve and can't get into your rain barrels? So if you've got sensitive plants to metals, you might not want to use this word for those. Okay, just kind of a heads up, but these are great things to slow that water down. It intercepts that water from running straight to our creeks and rivers, and mainly to our gutters. I mean, um, street curves. Another way we can deal with storm in an urban setting, and really in the rural setting too, is bioretention ponds. Now how many of you have ever seen a bioretention pond? Cool. And then Karen is probably going to talk about this next year, the design, the, the mathematical equations, and all that, right, Karen? Probably not, right? Um, but as a geeky engineer, the equations is kind of fun for me. But the bioretention ponds is a way to slow that water down, and a lot of times we can make rain gardens out of these bioretention ponds. And the rain garden is sort of like the bioretention pond. So can you put a nice um, rain garden in your front yard, in your backyard, side yard, wherever, where it holds that water long enough, the plants can uptake it, it settles out any sediment, and then some of that water is going to get released back to the, the stormwater drain, but it does it in a very slow fashion. 
So it doesn't get to the creek and river so fast that it's going to overwhelm that creek and river and cause flooding. Just another example of a bioretention pond, again, um, sort of like a rain garden. I mean, they have some peculiarities that's the difference between them, but pretty much they, they function the same. Kieran, don't have a heart attack over there. <coughs> this is a, a bioretention pond down on um, in Richmond Hill. If you're from that part, it's right in their little new recreational area. But you can see, I mean, it, it, it doesn't look like anything. But if you dig down, it's got this biomedia, um, this bioretention pond media that allows that water to get in there. It holds it sort of like a wetland. And then over 48 hours, it releases that water back to the local creek or stream. In this case, it's a little ditch that runs around here and then goes out to the river. But the purpose of these bioretention ponds is to hold that water long enough so that it evens the flow out to our creek and river, mimicking what was there before. And what this does is actually drains the parking lot. And just for additional information, the asphalt you see here on the bottom is actually pervious concrete. So the water goes through that, some of it infiltrates before the heavy stuff runs off into the bioretention pond. This is also down on the coast. I want to say it's in Richmond Hill, but probably it's near Richmond Hill, I'll put it that way. These are just bioswales in the middle of this parking lot. They redid the um, recreational area, um, or the recre yeah, the ball fields and whatnot. And what do you notice? There's no curve and gutter, is it? So what happens here is the water runs off of the asphalt, which is imperv impervious asphalt, but it gets into these swales. It slows that water down enough that we can get sediment settling out. It, it reduces some of the pollutant load, and then all this drains to the center over to a bioretention pond off to the right there. So again, it slows that water down, settles it out, reduces all a lot of that flooding back to the local creek or river, and holds that on site. Just some more rain gardens, um, just the design of them, again, just really slowing that water down, holding it in a condition that allows it, you see in this upper left-hand picture, to just infiltrate. And that's what we want, we want that water to infiltrate on site and not get into our creek or river system. Just another picture of a rain garden there. And, and, and if you're dealing with rain gardens, make sure, and, and again, you guys are the ones that know this, which plants like wet feet, which plants like dry feet, and which plants can do either. Um, and if you're a master gardener with the extension service, make sure your county extension agents start realizing this. And I'm not saying they don't, but start kind of working with them. Because what I'm doing on my end is trying to say, if you're using bioretention ponds, if you're using rain gardens, you guys, the extension agents, are the ones in the county that people look up to or go to to get information on what plant best fits here. And if the county or the city engineer needs to put in rain gardens, I'm encouraging the city and counties to go to the <coughs> extension agents. And so that's where I think y'all can come in if you're master gardeners is to help them as well understand some of the plants that can fit into this. Just another one, um, a rain garden. Again, all the water, and you notice the curve. I bet there's a curve, good, oh, cut, cut, not good, cut right there, where that water can go into this rain garden. And again, it infiltrates and it doesn't run downhill to our local creek or river. On the rural stormwater. Now this is what I think of when I think of rural stormwater. Now again, not picking on my county agents, okay? But when I ask them if that's stormwater, they go, no, that's erosion sediment. I'm like, yeah, you're right. It is, but it's also stormwater. Because remember what our definition of stormwater is, water that runs off after a big heavy rain. That's exactly what that is. And in rural Georgia, rural America, this is where our uh, sediment comes from. It runs pesticides off, it runs nutrients off, it runs pathogens off, if we've applied nutrients here. This is another one here in South Georgia, relatively flat, 
But even on flat ground, you can see the remnants of stormwater, where that water slows down, this sand settles out, and we get these big sand piles. Now for a farmer, okay, that's at the bottom of my hill, but now sandy soil don't grow crops as well as a good loamy soil with a bit of organic matter in it. So what we're looking at doing is some conservation tillage work, and I'll show you some pictures of that here shortly. But one of the other ways we can fix rural stormwater management or rural stormwater runoff is looking at these edge of field plantings. So can we plant something here at the edge of this pasture so as that water runs off of the pasture, it actually intercepts or the plants intercept that. You can see the little, um, the little plants there. So those roots will go down and absorb it and um, take up some of that water that runs off, the nutrients, and it protects this stream. If you look at this one, there's a little buffer on the right. So as the water runs off of that pasture, it actually will be taken up by this riparian buffer here before it gets to that creek or river. So again, those nutrients, that, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, um, manure, that runs off of this site, is taken up by this little riparian buffer here. Um, again, like I said, when I my a lot of my job before a couple of years ago was dealing with conservation tillage. And conservation tillage is actually planting a cover crop in the winter months on your cotton, peanut, cornfields. So that there's something living on that land all the time. On this left-hand picture, of some of our county agents and one of the farmers actually looking at the cover crop. This is a rock cover crop planted in October time frame. This time of the year, they're starting to knock it down. Um, they'll either kill it with glyphosate or Roundup, um, and then, or they'll roll it with a big, basically a big roller, um, a rolling pin. It's a big rolling pin with little spikes on it that just knocks this stuff down. But what that does is, in this bottom right hand corner, is it forms a mulch bed for that field. Now, how many of you mulch your flower beds? Well, farmers can't go out and grab some mulch <laughs> and put it on the back of their pickup truck and go throw it out on a thousand acres of land. So they grow their mulch in place, and that's the rock. So they grow it in place. It takes up some of that water. It actually recycles some of those nutrients. So if we put a lot of nitrogen on the ground, and when we're growing this cotton, corn, peanuts, whatever, if we get heavy rains, especially here in South Georgia, it's going to leach some of that nitrogen below the root zone. If it leaches it below the root zone, then that rye actually has a four to five to six foot root zone that it gets into. It can pull those nutrients back up when we lay that rye on the ground in the summertime, like you see in this cotton crop. As it breaks down, it releases that nitrogen. So it kind of recycles some of those nutrients for us. My job. And what I'm looking at is once we get this in place, how does it hold moisture in the ground? And some of the research we've done is actually showing that by using conservation tillage, the water, we don't lose water as fast if we didn't have any cover on the ground. Almost two and a half to three times slower with mulch on the ground. And y'all probably seen that in your own flower beds. You don't lose water as fast. And so by doing this, um, we can one save water and reduce the runoff. Some other ways, um, this picture you see the, <coughs> the upper left hand corner is erosion. Bottom right hand corner is an NRCS practice called grass waterways. So again, you, you let the water go where it wants to go, you just protect the ground with grass in this case. And on the yellowish on the right and left is wheat. So we're growing wheat outside the grass channel. The grass channel lets water off that field without eroding that water or the soil away. Um, so now to the public education in the last couple minutes here. So every once in a while as part of my job, again, we need to do public education. So can anybody tell me where this is? Georgia National Fair. Right. So past, I guess about 10 years ago, the lady who runs the HHM building, is that right? Okay. Yes, MMH, sorry. I got all my letters mixed up. So 
In there, she wanted to put in this bottom right-hand corner, and you can see it in the upper left-hand corner too, a storm order, or a, what she call it? Um, thunderstorm experience of Georgia. Because she said a lot of folks didn't know what a thunderstorm felt like, and you sitting on a front porch with this thunderstorm and, and a metal roof. So she made this little front porch. I can't remember her name right now. Sandy. Sandy. No, it was one before Sandy. Laura, right. So Miss Laura called me and she says, Gary, I've got this front porch. I need something around it. Can you do some education stuff on just general water? So these are two different things we did over about 10 year time period. So the guys that did the pond would come in and in this upper left hand corner, um, Miss Laura always gave me the option of telling her what we wanted it to look like. She always wanted it different every year. So one year, the upper left hand corner, I said, well, what if we just make in this long flowing landscape and we do different sections to show how farming and agriculture and homeowners actually protect water quality? And she goes, well, what does that look like? So I drew it out and that's what it turned out to be. So the pond guys actually built all that for us. And so as the water runs off of the house and off of the tin roof, it hits the pond, and in this case, in the upper left-hand corner that year, I told her, I said, let's have a river running down through there. And you can see the different areas. So in the upper right-hand corner is a construction site, and then it's got a home site, and then an agricultural site. This beige right here in the front is an agricultural lamp conservation tillage. And the front, um, are you taking pictures, Miss Linda? Cool. <laughs> Um, and then the bottom right hand corner then is your home, your lawn. So that was one year. And, and we put the signs up there. And you know the prayer runs for about two weeks. And I told Ms. Laura and Sandy, I can't stand there for two weeks. But we'll try our best to educate the public on it. This other one is, as you see there, the rain barrel. So we captured the water. We had some signs that talk about rain barrels and, and their, their use. One year I've got a 8 by 10 foot water cycle. Excuse me, water cycle. We put it up there. And so every year we try to do something a little bit different just to teach everybody that walked through there about water, water conservation, water management, and that type of stuff. Some of the other things um, is we have this rainfall simulator. So we can take it out in the farm fields. I take it to the schools. I've taken it to groups like this before. And we can actually show with, you can see the little um, buckets there in the front, that if we use different types of cover on our ground, we get different amounts of runoff and we get different sediment loads coming off of the different soil treatments, if you want to call it that. So you can see, I'll point here in the middle of the grass. And since I'm close enough over here, I'll come over here to you guys. Right here, the grass one on the far left. You guys way over there, the far left, um, is grass right beside that ugly guy in the blues pants. Um, you can see grass. We had grass um, cover crops. Um, I think in this one um, we might even have some pine straw for mulch. And then this one closest to me next to Mr. Robert, you can see kind of reddish soil there. It's just bare soil. So this um, is a way that we can irrigate it, if you want to call it a rain on it, on these soil trays for just a couple minutes and show people um, how different covers protect our soil. And a lot of times I've heard from farmers and school groups especially, man, that makes sense now that I can see it. And this is something I can go in the back of my truck, take it out 10 minutes, and it's done. Um, but, it, but it shows the importance of keeping that ground covered. Um, how many of you have ever seen the Viruscape? The Viruscape is this little model here that I'm demonstrating in the upper left hand corner. A um, couple of you have. If you haven't seen one, um, the Viruscape is a watershed model. It's a very good way to show how pollution runs downhill, how what we do on the land affects the water. County Extension Offices has access to these. Um, there's a couple in the district. I bought one for each district, and we've got four districts in Extension. Um, and we just made videos of all these last year. Um, there's the, and I'm going to point here only to the middle, but 
in the bottom right hand corner of the model is agriculture in the upper left hand corner is construction just south of the construction is urban areas you see the brown creek or the beige areas the little creek running through the middle where i have that blue bottle there um, is the industrial site um, what else is on the agricultural again and then there's ditches so we went through i had a student working with me last year and we went through and made 10 different videos of this one in water and wastewater treatment that are about five to ten minutes long that explains each section of this firescape with the thought that the county agents could use it for their 4-h club meetings and if you guys want those um we're actually getting them put up on youtube now so you can show the effect of how water running downhill affects our water resources um this guy in the middle with his hand raised is well, I think with this group last year up at Cordell, um, not specifically the Wildflower Symposium, but um, the Georgia Garden Club last year up in, um, in Cordell. Um, and then I've been trying to run a blog. It's, it goes pretty well, but um, just trying to put some information out there, one for county agents and anybody that's interested in what's going on with water um, and such as that. So it's just blog.extension.uga.edu slash water. Um, and then the UGA, the College of Agronomic Sciences, has their water page that we've been trying to keep them updated on relevant um, information. And then the last picture um, is when we start thinking about Georgia's water resources, um, I think of it as a big bucket, um, a big barrel. And there's, everybody has their straw in this big barrel of water. From the agricultural side on the blue, industry there, the yellow, municipal for us um, in North Georgia, that water comes out of creeks and rivers. Here in South Georgia, that water comes out of the aquifer system. So there's that straw in our water resources. Um, citizens use water. You know, citizens use water for fishing, hunting, hiking, boating, um, drinking. Um, habitat, if you're... Um, if you like bird watching or you're part of NWF or any of those other groups, Habitat needs that water. And Habitat needs that clean water. So that straw is in our bucket. And then other states, we're just coming, I'll say coming out of the water war. Um, I think we're at a, a new stopping point in the water war. Um, I'll put it that way. Um, but other states need the water and share the water that we use. If you look at the Savannah River, you got South Carolina and Georgia that share that water resource. If you look at the Chattahoochee and the Chattahoochee River, Alabama and Georgia share that water resource. If you look at the Flint River, the Apalachicola Bay, we share that water with Florida. So we got water to use. We get 52 inches of rain on average per year here in Georgia, but everybody needs the use of that water. And part of my job, like I said earlier, is to really deal with a lot of this and how I educate the agents and you guys um, on making sure we all have some hand in that and, and hopefully we're not leaving one group out to benefit another group, if that makes sense. And with that, so just some conclusions. What is our most important aspect of our lives? Obviously, you know, what do they say? You go without food for three or four days, but water for like a day type thing. Um, to protect water, it starts on your watershed. So again, how many of you live in a watershed? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Yes. My job here is good. Um, there's both urban and rural um, stormwater. Again, if you know your county agent, especially in the rural county, very well, don't say, hey, what do we do about stormwater out on so-and-so's farm? And if it's your farm, it would be even better. Um, but just ask them and see what they say. And then public education is needed. Again, I know I mentioned it a couple times, if y'all have K-12 groups um, that you work with in your garden clubs, just teaching them about water and using those environments and those things to just show them that what they do on the land affects the water resources is a big help. And I work, I try to work with fifth graders, sixth graders, because they're learning about water cycles, they're learning about erosion sediment control and that's another way to get into the kids and so your issues fit right with management of water resources so y'all keep up the good work and i think with that 
I won't finish up. And so these are my two girls a couple years ago. And like I said, they, um, that's actually a lot a couple years ago. But, um, <laughs> Because one of them, the oldest one in the yellow, just turned 15 a couple days ago, and the little one here front turns 11 on Saturday. But this is the reason I like to deal with water. And again, these two I know are going to need clean water in the future. When they don't think so now, but I know they will in the future. And again, when I stand out in the rain and I look at the puddles of water, they stand out there with me. This oldest one right here in the yellow. When we moved to Oconee County, um, we've got a storm drain right in front of our house. I don't know how many times she goes, Daddy, it's raining. I'm like, yeah, Millie, I know. She goes, let's get her clothes on and go watch the water run down the storm drain. I'm like, okay, let's go. So there was many a time we had an umbrella with a camera taking pictures of the storm water runoff. And she led the effort to do that. So. I know she don't think it, but now she's got that in her head, and this is something we need to think about. And with that, I'll finish up. I know I'm about three minutes over, and luckily they didn't run the fire alarm. But if y'all got any questions, I'll try to answer them. Yes, ma'am. <laughs>
we would go to a house and I'd drive up with her and I go, Kim, I don't like this house. And she goes, Carrie, you haven't seen the inside. It's got new of this and new that and the carpet's great and it's an upstairs upstairs and downstairs. And I'm like, yeah, but look at it, Kim. And she goes, Carrie, what's wrong with it? It's a pretty color. They just painted it. I said, look, the water runs right down the middle of the front driveway. And she goes, oh, so you don't want to look at the house? I said, Karen, no. I mean, Kim, no. We went to another one, and she goes, what about this one? It's great. And I said, yeah, it is. Let's walk around it first. And we walk around, and I go, don't like this one. And she goes, why not? She goes, something's wrong with it. What? And I said, well, see this back deck back here? The creek runs up under it when it storms. And so there's a waterway, and you can see the sedimentation underneath the deck. So I don't want that one. She goes, you know what? I've been doing this for 20 years. Nobody has ever looked at the water first and then the house second. Said, That's what you get when you get a water guy looking at a house. So with that, the same thing, I'll turn it back over to you.